year is called the Leadership Lecture Series. The intent of the Leadership Lecture Series is to bring in some of our leaders from the installation to come tell their story. Um, it's informal. It's really supposed to be over lunch, and we thought we were going to be in the conference room, small group, round table. But, um, and as she tells her story, you know, she's often talked to her about her leadership TTPs and uh, nuggets of wisdom. And then once she finishes, you know, after about 15, 20 minutes, it's, it's open. It's really informal, you know, Q&A for us just to hear stories of, from our very own leaders. And so we are blessed to have, um, you know, Laura Brigham General Lindemann, who is the, 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 the joint base, the 502nd, what we call it, uh, JBSA commander. And I, what I just found out that this is the largest um, joint base in the Department of Defense. So... I'm not going to introduce her because I'll be telling her story. And so, without further ado, please give me a warm round of applause for Jim Lennon. All right. I'll, do I need this? Do I need this? Yes? No? Maybe so? Okay. Well, we'll I'll, I'll use it for a little bit, and then if I don't need it, we can put it down. But thank you, sir, so much for the invitation. It is such an, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, I can honestly say I haven't been inside this building. I've driven by it. I know a lot about it because you have a wonderful advocate in Ms. Gary. So <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, but it's truly an honor to be here and to serve all of you. Uh, as our command chief is also here, Chris Lantain, and uh, we work really hard uh, to listen and understand what your challenges are. Um, so if we, when we get to Q&A, if there's things you want to talk about, whether it's um, related to what we, we end up talking about on the slides or if it's related to just living here at Fort Sam or Joint Base San Antonio, we are all ears and we'll take good notes. If I don't know the answer, we'll get the answer and we'll get it back to you. Um, so with that, I just wanted to say thank you, sir. Um, thanks for your leadership. Congratulations on the command. And we look forward to serving with you here at Joint Base San Antonio as you move up and down the coast and, <laughs> and back down to Texas. Um, but we just wanted to take a couple of, of minutes. And um, my chief and I, we've been in the uh, command team for about a year and a half now. Uh, we didn't know each other before. So the Air Force does it a slightly different than the Army um, where we, we hope for the best. We get a slate of people to choose from, and uh, we got lucky because uh, I, I got a great chief here that's been a perfect partner in this journey of Joint Base San Antonio. Um, so he's going to help me with the leadership piece of the discussion, but I can give you a couple, a broad uh, brush of my experience and where I came from, and I just spent time talking to the boss about um, growing up in Virginia. So I grew up in the military. Uh, my dad was an Air Force officer and uh, ended up at the Pentagon. So that's where my sister and I went to high school in West Springfield, if you've been stationed up there. Uh, so go Spartans, class of 89, just had my 30th reunion <laughs> and got to go back last month. So it was fun to see um, some old friends, but bring back a lot of good memories of growing up in that part of the country. Lots of opportunities, great schools, great sports, and that's what my sister and I we played sports, um, we worked hard in school, and uh, she ended up getting a softball scholarship uh, to a school in Georgia called Mercer University, and I ended up getting an ROTC scholarship to Duke University. Um, so I got to go there for four years in the early 90s, where we won two back-to-back -back championships. So as we're getting deep in, <laughs> UNC fan, I'm sure, or Kentucky, or somebody that beats Duke. but. Um, but exciting time to be in a, at a school that has a lot of, um, you know, strong academic program, but a, a strong athletic program, too. And that was a perfect fit for, for me because that's how kind of how I lived my uh, high school years, uh, focusing on both of those things. I played softball in high school also, but Duke didn't have a softball team, uh, so I didn't get to play. And so my team became the Air Force uh, right away. And I remember walking into the detachment at the time thinking, I feel at home. I feel like these, I didn't know a single person, but I knew they had the same values, the same foundation. We all believed in the same core values, even at that young age. And it was just comforting to be surrounded by folks that believed in what you believed in, especially in a large school where people came from all over the country, similar to the military. We come from all walks of life, um, but we were united by a single cause. And it was a source of strength because you can get lost as young people often do at, at that age and, and having an impression. Um, but they kept me on the straight and narrow and I graduated in 93, went to pilot training at Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi, 
in a small town uh, there in Mississippi and started flying uh, T-37s and T-38s, which we still fly the T-38 today. So that aircraft, my dad flew it in the 60s, I flew it in the 90s, we're still flying it now in the, in the 2000s, but we're about ready to get a new aircraft in the next couple of years uh, called the T-7. So it's named after T Tuskegee Airmen. Um, exciting time to be, it'll be out at Randolph, hopefully. They haven't made the basing decision yet, but it should be out there. So they've got a red tail flash and it was pretty exciting. They unveiled that um, this past September. So uh, looking back to our lineage there. So um, flying those two aircraft, that was a, a challenging time too, because I didn't come from a pilot. Uh, even though I, my dad was a pilot, I didn't grow up flying. So I was learning everything as, as I was uh, training, and that can be challenging when you're learning a new skill and you're under pressure. Uh, but I also was blessed because that's where I also met my husband, and he was going through the exact same thing. We were in the same class, and we were spending 12 hours a day together, and I always say you either end up loving each other or you hate each other. <laughs> and luckily, we loved each other. And um, he proposed during pilot training, and then we got married uh, during our first assignment in Grand Forks, North Dakota. So that was another, yeah, can I hear that? Yeah. So we were, we were uh, challenged with the weather up there, um, but it was the best assignment. Um, starting in the early, mid-90s, mid a lot was changing in the military. We were coming out of the Cold War. Um, we're going into the more deployments than we'd ever seen before. So the culture of the Air Force was changing, the culture of the KC-135 community, which is where I ended up uh, in Grand Forks flying that aircraft for the next 15 years. That was changing. We were no longer SAC warriors where we sat alert and, uh, and stayed at home. We were now out on the road. And so I spent the next several years um, flying out of there and learning how to fly. We're back. Okay. Then uh, throughout your, your pilot career, for those of you that are in aviation, you, you upgrade to an aircraft commander, instructor, evaluator. So I was starting to do all those things when I got selected for a special program called the Air Force Intern Program. And I was a young captain, and they sent you to the Pentagon for two years, where you, uh, they sent you to George Washington University to get your master's degree. And then you also worked in the Pentagon uh, during the day and went to school at night. And uh, that was a great experience. I met 50 other captains in the program. They became the cohort that I grew up with for the next 20 years. And a lot of them are serving today. In, uh, one, one's over at Randolph, in fact, but they're all still my best friends. So it was another great foundational uh, group of folks to grow up with and turn to. And then I had to go back to flying, which was a, a, a great time to go back because it was the early, late, late 90s, early 2000s, right before 9-11. So we were stationed out in Spokane, Washington, someplace we'd never lived before. And, um, and we were actually deployed overseas to Saudi Arabia when 9-11 happened. And that was a very interesting time to be deployed uh, when our country was under attack. And then uh, to come back and see what everybody had just gone through, but not really feel, you know, we weren't there when it happened. And so it was just an interesting um, trying to understand and get your head around what the community was going through. But we weren't home long. It's about two weeks later and I would redeployed. And then the rest is history that we've all been living over the last 19 years. So deployments, <laughs> deployments, deployments, and then uh, getting to go to school, education, professional military education. Uh, we moved around a couple more times, advanced in our uh, flying careers, and then started command. So I, I, my first squadron, or my only squadron command, which is the 05 level command, was in uh, California, so Travis Air Force Base out there, and there's a big hospital, one of the only big hospitals in the Air Force. Um, so David, David Grant, that was, that was interesting uh, time to be in the wing too, and uh, go, the military medicine was going through a lot at that point as well. Um, from there, I got to go to school. I got to a Harvard uh, fellowship for a year and got to wear uh, civilian clothes and be grow my hair out. No, it was already grown out. <laughs> got to wear it down and then uh, came back and went to the Pentagon and worked at um, the Joint Staff, J-8, and then commanded the, my first wing at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois, which is also where I'd grown up. So my dad had been stationed there in the early 80s, so it was coming home. And it was so awesome to be um, an adult and be the commander of the base that I loved so much as a child. It meant uh, a lot to our family, too. And then, then I ended up here. So spent a year at Transcom in between and then and came to Joint Base San Antonio. 
But that's my story in a, in a broad brush, and uh, it's been an adventure. There have been highs and lows, and it's been challenging being a joint spouse, as you all that are joint spouse, I'm sure you can relate to that. Um, my husband just re uh, retired last summer, and that's another experience that he's going through and we're going through, and what's, how do you, the emotions and, you know, where do I fit, what do I do, who am I? It's all happening right now live on television, <laughs> and it is challenging. So I'm extremely grateful for the, the transition programs because um, they're, they're extremely important. Um, and please, if you haven't taken advantage of them, please do, because um, they do help you understand what you're going through and also what's out there for you. So as we work through that, we are, we're now we're coming toward the last half of our, our tour here, and we're running strong and running fast, and uh, we want to finish strong. And with that, I'd like to bring the chief up, and we're going to talk a little bit about leading in this environment uh, called Joint Face San Antonio, uh, unlike anything we've ever seen before, as I can imagine you feel the same, um, I think. <laughs> but... This is uh, just a word picture of some of the things that, that we think about when, as we're leading uh, this, this organization uh, called the 502nd Air Base Wing, which is about 8,000 people. Um, so we are part of Joint Base San Antonio, mainly civilians, three-quarters civilians, and uh, the, the remaining are military. We do deploy. Uh, we have a, a, about 1,000 th people um, that deploy uh, from the Air Force and, you know, 100 or so, a couple hundred throughout the year from our wing. So that's still part of our mission. But we're dealing with decision-making, readiness, challenges, um, you know, trusting but verifying. You know, as you come in as a new command team, you, you, you trust everybody, but you need to verify that, yes, it is a, 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 the standard that we want uh, to maintain. Assuming risk, you know, we're in a resource-challenged uh, environment, so we have to balance, you know, where do we assume the most risk? And can we assume the most risk? And, of course, if you were here this past year, you know that, the, air, the department has assumed a lot of risk in infrastructure. And you, you live it every day as you drive along our roads. It's a little bumpy. <laughs> and you're in your buildings that are hot and cold and usually hot in the, uh, in the uh, summertime and cold in the wintertime. So those are the things that we are constantly, constantly working on and toward. Uh, but this summer, one of the biggest challenges we faced was the mold in the dorms and our, and our defects. And now we're also dealing uh, with the challenges of military housing. And we can talk anything about that that you'd like to talk about if that's a subject that's interesting to you. Um, but with that, we, I want to turn it over to the chief real quick, and he's going to tee up. We have a couple videos, and, and we'll show a quick one real quick, and then we'll, we'll press on. So I'm, I'm miked, so I think oh, I'm good. Sorry about that. Am I good? All right. I don't necessarily need the mic anyway, but uh, so I'm miked up. Um, so, uh, yeah, the boss and I got together uh, about 14 months ago uh, for the first time, and uh, we kind of talked about what is this, what is our command team, uh, what does our tour look like? And uh, one of the things that we discussed was about changing culture and trying to create a culture of connectedness within our organization. Um, we kind of felt when we got here and we got the pulse of the organization that uh, it was a little disparate. Uh, folks kind of often in their own stovepipes and kind of doing their own things, and there wasn't really kind of a mission or, or, or a singular vision uh, where everybody was kind of marching forward. And then, in addition, here we are with this big, dynamic, joint base beast uh, that we're responsible for. Uh, so that's kind of how we, we set forth uh, as, as a command team to get after this. And, and one of our focuses that kind of underpinned everything that we do is that connectedness piece and trying to build that culture and get everybody to, to kind of be on the same page and know that, that we are all part of the same team. Uh, and, and this is, is uh, as, as you can see with the word picture here, uh, there's three words that kind of stand out uh, in the middle, listen, love, and lift up. And, uh, and we, we stole this. We didn't steal this. Uh, the, the boss kind of walked in with this. Uh, and I'll, I'll steal your thunder a little bit and kind of tee up where that comes from. Uh, Laura Lenderman, her middle initial is L, so three L's, three L's. Kind of getting the, the gist there, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. My initials are CML. I'm kind of old school, brown shoe. Uh, CML for me is a little bit different. I have my own leadership style. It's uh, chastise, malign, and light up. Uh, but that didn't necessarily work in this environment, so it uh, probably works for you guys. That's, that's very uh, Army mentality, I think. Um, no? That's not what I, oh, I wasn't supposed to talk about. General Bagby made his comment earlier, 
Uh, so, so I'm a medic by trade. Um, so I'm a tiny badge wearer too uh, on the Air Force side. I'm a medic by trade. Uh, and I've been in kind of headquarters leadership positions uh, for about the last 10 years. I was what we call a group superintendent, a medical group superintendent at two installations. Uh, and this is my third job as a command chief. Uh, second wing level, did a numbered Air Force in between. Uh, but uh, so, so yeah, we, we all kind of have our own leadership philosophies that we come in with. But this really was kind of the boss's philosophy anyway. And it really tied into what we needed to do with this wing, uh, with the connectedness piece. Uh, and it's all about really just that day-to-day -day interaction and, and how much impact you can have on another individual with a very small, just a, a word, a look, uh, you know, a high five, or maybe sometimes a kick in the ass if that's what's needed, but, you know, with love, right? So, uh, so yeah, so that, that's kind of the tee up for the video, but I think the video is on the next slide. If we can just run that video. And I went to a video. school in a little school called Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. And on my last day there, a girl came up to me and she said, I remember the first time that I met you. And then she told me a story that happened four years earlier. She said, on my day before I started university, I was in the hotel room with my mom and my dad. And I was so scared and so convinced that I couldn't do this, that I wasn't ready for university, that I just burst into tears. And my mom and my dad were amazing. They were like, look, we know you're scared, but let's just go tomorrow. Let's go to the first day. And if at any point you feel as if you can't do this, that's fine. Just tell us. We will take you home. We love you no matter what. And she says, so I went the next day, and I was standing in line getting ready for registration, and I looked around, and I just knew I couldn't do it. I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I had to quit. And she says, I made that decision, and as soon as I made it, there was this incredible feeling of peace that came over me. And I turned to my mom and my dad to tell them that we needed to go home. And just at that moment, you came out of the student union building wearing the stupidest hat I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was awesome. And you had a big sign uh, promoting Shiner M, which is Students Fighting Cystic Fibrosis, a charity I've worked with for years. And you had a bucket full of lollipops. And you were walking along and you were handing the lollipops out to people in line and talking about Shinerama. And all of a sudden, you got to me and you just stopped and you stared. It was creepy. <laughs> this girl right here knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then you looked at the guy next to me and you smiled and you reached in your bucket, you pulled out a lollipop and you held it out to him. And you said, you need to give a lollipop to the beautiful woman standing next to you. And she said, I have never seen anyone get more embarrassed faster in my life. He turned beet red, and he wouldn't even look at me. He just kind of held the lollipop out like this. <laughs> and I felt so bad for this dude that I took the lollipop. And as soon as I did, you got this incredibly severe look on your face, and you looked at my mom and my dad, and you said, look at that. Look at that. First day away from home, and already she's taking candy from a stranger. <laughs> and she said, everybody lost it. 20 feet in every direction, everyone started to howl. And I know this is cheesy, and I don't know why I'm telling you this. But in that moment when everyone was laughing, I knew that I shouldn't quit. I knew that I was where I was supposed to be, and I knew that I was home. And I haven't spoken to you once in the four years since that day, but I heard that you were leaving. And I had to come up and tell you that you've been an incredibly important person in my life, and I'm going to miss you. Good luck. And she walks away, and I'm flattened. And she gets about six feet away, she turns around and smiles and goes, you should probably know this too. I'm still dating that guy four years later. <laughs> A year and a half after I moved to Toronto... I got an invitation to their wedding. Here's the kicker. I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that moment. And I've searched my memory banks because that is funny and I should remember doing it. And I don't remember it. And that was such an eye-opening, transformative moment for me to think that the, maybe the biggest impact I'd ever had on anyone's life, a moment that had a, a woman walk up to a stranger four years later and say, you've been an incredibly important person in my life, was a moment that I didn't even remember. How many of you guys have a lollipop moment, a moment where someone said something or did something that you feel fundamentally made your life better? All right. How many of you have told that person they did it? See, why not? We celebrate birthdays where all you have to do is not die for 365 days. <laughs> and yet we let people who have made our lives better walk around without knowing it. And every single one of you, every single one of you has been the catalyst for a lollipop moment. You have made someone's life better by something that you said or that you did. And if you think you haven't, think about all the hands that didn't go back up when I asked that question. You're just one of the people who hasn't been told. I went to a school. So contrary to what you might think, we don't walk around with buckets of lollipops in the Air Force. And I know that that's what the, the, the Army thinks of us. But yeah, she's like, yeah, 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 sure you don't. Uh, so, so we use this as uh, we use this as as kind of a, uh, a foundation for one of our commanders' calls, uh, and the intent behind it was you, you don't know how impactful just simple interactions are, and the idea is just kind of keep that in mind as you're as you're going out and about, and and that's what we've used to kind of underpin anything, and and it's it's amazing the shift that we saw literally in the culture of our organization, 
And this commander's call where we, where we use that was almost a year ago now. It was about 10 months ago. Uh, and people are still saying lollipop moment. Uh, so it's, I, I mean, if you were to say lollipop moment within the 502nd Air Base Wing, people would know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so it, it sticks. The, the thought process sticks, sands the lollipops. But the idea being, you know, it's just, it's human interaction all day, every day. I mean, that, that's what we do here. And, uh, and it's very simple things that can really change somebody's life. And when we asked the same question that he asked in our commander's call, it was unanimous, the hands that went up, where people had that moment that was just so simple but so impactful and changed their lives. Uh, so, so that's kind of what is the underpin for those three. And I remember it was about, I don't know, a couple months ago when somebody came up to us, somebody came up to me after a change of command and said, that, lo that moment that you, that you showed the video, that was the lollipop moment for that person. And they were going through a really tough time. Um, they alluded to some things that they might do in terms of harming themselves. And then they saw that video and they saw uh, you know, us talking about you know, how we care about people and it changed that person's life. So at, at the same time, we also, it's also a gentle reminder that even when you're having a bad day, uh, you don't want to project that onto other folks. And that's, that's really the gist of, of some of the other things we're going to talk about today is those lollipop moments can have the opposite effect too. That one time that you meet someone, and one of my bosses used to say, how do you want to be remembered? And he didn't mean it like at the end of your command tour, but every day, like what interaction do you have with one person? That's, this is the only time I might see some of you, and this, this is it. I have one chance to make a positive impression and, and hopefully lift you up today or have the opposite and perhaps, you know, create a bad day. That's not the goal. This is going to be a fun day. So listen, love, lift up. We're just going to walk through, I think the next couple of slides, we'll walk through each L. And so we'll start with listen, and uh, it seems fairly obvious. Uh, this is a pretty senior group here that listening is critical as leadership in leadership. And as we get older, I found that I listen a whole lot more than I talk. In fact, um, even though I'm talking a lot today, I'm, I'm generally not a talker. I'm more of an introvert, and I prefer to listen. And that used to be, um, I think, perceived as a weakness when I was gro growing up, especially in the career field that I was in in operations. Um, but she's not talking, or she's soft-spoken, she's not very tall, she's not very, you know, when she walks in the room, I even had one boss say, we need, we need General, or it was Colonel Linderman, we need Colonel Linderman to walk in the room, you need to be six feet tall, and so on and so forth. I'm never going to be six feet tall, I'm 5'5", five five. <laughs> I've been this way my whole life, um, these things have worked, you know, at this point, so it really made me question who I was and what I actually contributed, and at that point, my dad had just passed away, I was fragile, emotionally, personally, and then now professionally, I'm getting hit on that side of it, the thing that I thought I was doing okay in, it was kind of rock bottom for me, and I was a 20-year colonel, like I was, I'd been in the service for a while, and so it was that point when I, I just, you know, resolved to myself that, hey, if this isn't good enough for the Air Force today, and they need somebody different, I'm okay with that, I'm at peace with that, I can move on, and it was like a freeing moment. And when I could let that go of what people expected me to be and actually be me, be authentic, that was one of the words on the previous slide, um, I was that much stronger and it became even a better, I think, I hope, a better person, a better wife, a better friend, a better leader. Um, but listening is a big part of that. Listening to the folks around you, listening with your whole, their whole body. It's not just what they're saying, it's their body language. And it's also what they're not saying. And uh, this is an example the chief's going to talk about that, was, that occurred here just a couple months ago uh, over by the BAMC uh, gate. I did. Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a horrible listener, my wife will tell you, if you ask her. Um, so I, that's, that's one of my challenges I have to, I have to work on. I, I saw a smile. So I think every, <laughs> every woman in the room went, yeah, mine too. Um, so, yeah, that, that's something I, I have to work on extremely hard. Uh, there's just so much going on in there, and, and I find myself sometimes in situations where I've got a young airman or a young soldier, and I'm having a conversation, and, and it's really just, it's, it's not sticking. I, I appear to be there, but for whatever reason, I'm not. And, and so uh, this picture here, uh, the boss and I will go out and do out and about. So uh, from a listen perspective, that's one of the other things with this culture of connectedness, right? You've got to be out there. You've got to be in, in with your folks, leadership by walking around. Uh, we, do, we do several um, uh, we get after that in several different ways. We, like I said, we do some out and abouts. We have a, a feedback program where people can, can ping the boss directly through our PA, uh, and we answer any question that we get. Uh, we, we, um, we also do uh, 
these kind of similar to this kind of lunch sessions with different subgroups of our of our organization to hear what they have to say. But this was during one of our out and abouts. We went out to security forces. Uh, these uh, two defenders, the two young men there, uh, were working our uh, our beach gate over at the Bamsey compound. Uh, we had some construction going on there, there at one point, and we knew there was construction going on, and, and we knew our CE folks had had that all contracted out. Uh, there's two lanes in, two lanes out in that gate, and there's uh, kind of the, the shack in the middle. We were doing some construction on the uh, on the inbound, so we had a, we had inbound and outbound going through the same two lanes on one side. So what that did is it put our defenders in the middle of two lanes of traffic, uh, and you know even though the sign says five miles an hour, people don't always do five miles an hour, particularly on the outbound because they're heading home. Um, and there were some uh, there were some near misses. We were hearing from these guys. It was being pretty sporty. And uh, we got young airmen out there, and they're told, man, your post, and they man their post. Um, and then through co course of conversation, we realized, like, well, damn, we, this is, this is kind of dangerous. Uh, this could potentially be a safety issue. So uh, we walked away, we mitigated, and, and in, in addition to the conversation that we had with them, they got to see results immediately. Uh, and that's huge. Uh, and like I said, not always good at the listening thing, and sometimes it sticks, it connects, but the follow-up piece doesn't happen. And then the person that you had a conversation with doesn't necessarily know that anything ever happened. As far as they're concerned, you weren't listening. Uh, so these guys got to see immediate result from, from this out and about. The one star and the command chief came and talked to them and shook their hand and patted them on the back. And oh, by the way, their work environment changed overnight. So that, that was a big win. And, and another side note about this squadron in particular is um, they, were they, they were struggling. They had a uh, not great leadership um, history. Uh, they'd had a commander removed. They had another commander removed. So things were not great in this squadron in particular. So they really needed advocacy. They needed support. And um, we also learned personal things about them. You know, one is going to be a new dad and, you know, all the kinds of life events that are happening that we might not know as we're driving through the gates. Uh, and this is also a plug to say, hey, be kind to our gate guards <laughs> as you go through the gates. They they are working hard and they they have long days and uh, long shifts and, and long careers doing very similar duties. So if you can say a kind word, that would be great. Likewise, if you're having challenges with the gates, let me know. I would love to, to address it. But uh, with love. So love is the foundation of everything that I personally do. And um, I think it unites all of us. We love our country. That's why we joined for the most part. Um, there might be other reasons why we joined, but at the foundation, at the very core, it's because we love this country. So that's a, a uniting principle. Um, as we get older, we start to form a very special bond with the people around us. So for me, I always say we join for different reasons, but we stay for the same reason. And that's the people to your left and your right, your brothers and sisters. And that's why so many of us retire from the military and then continue to serve. So I thank all of our civilian workforce. We in the 502nd would not be able to do our job without the tremendous um, government employees that we have working today. So love is about loving each other, doing everything we can to support each other, literally um, putting ourselves in harm way to take care of each other. But it's also loving each other enough that we discipline when it's appropriate. We take care of the mission. We hold people to the highest standards. And when they don't raise to that standard or rise to that standard, uh, then we have to address it as leaders. That's the most important thing that we do is for the good of the wing, for the good of the organization, one of the toughest things we do. Um, but it's absolutely critical. And Chief's going to tell a story about loving in that kind of environment with regards to our, our public affairs team. So uh, football fans, Packers fans, a couple Packers fans. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't turn around, sir. <laughs> There's a lot of this. Uh, first coach of the first uh, first Super Bowl winning team, Vince Lombardi. There you go, the Lombardi Trophy. So uh, Vince Lombardi has a great quote. I love this quote. I think this is going to resonate with y'all. Uh, the quote is, uh, my love for you will be relentless. Uh, so that's kind of in tune with this. Uh, you know, love isn't always like, you know, pat on the back and, you know, hugs and kisses and lollipops and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes love is a kick in the ass when, when needed. Um, this was kind of an organizational kick in the ass. So our public affairs staff, we have a phenomenal public affairs staff, largest public affairs staff in, in the Air Force. Uh, this is just a fraction of them. Uh, they were dysfunctional when we got here. Uh, and as we kind of marched on, we realized that it was the leader of the organization that was really causing the dysfunction. The folks were phenomenal, and they really wanted to do the work, and they really wanted to do things, and they had some great ideas. Uh, the leader was in way over his head. Uh, and it was a civilian employee, pretty high-level civilian employee, and, and uh, I'm 
I'm sure it's probably the same on the Army side as it is on the Air Force side. It's kind of difficult to have, a, if you have a civilian employee that's not necessarily pulling their weight, it's kind of difficult sometimes to, to correct or remove. Uh, more difficult than it is on the active duty side, anyway. Uh, so it, it was a long haul. It was, it was kind of a, a long run, but long story short, um, we eventually did remove that civilian, and, and the boss will tell you about her conversation with him. I'll, I'll let her do that. But this was kind of after the fact, and this is the kind of that core group at public affairs, and this was a few months later, and they were just on all cylinders, and they were doing some, some yeoman's work for us. Uh, and it was just the one individual that, that was causing problems in there. And he wasn't a bad person, just was in the wrong place. And I'll yeah, and it's amazing when you're um, at, at a leadership position where you have a, a lot of great leaders below you and you can see the organizations that are functioning well or the ones that aren't. And as the, my previous wing commander job, there was a squadron that was pretty much at the bottom of my list of, of one to end squadrons. One leadership change later at the top, so one squadron commander change, and this squadron became the top performing squadron. People were still the same, just the leadership changed. So that, to me, was a perfect example of, of how each individual, especially when you have leadership, good leadership is great, but bad leadership, we need to address it. Give them a chance to improve, and this person had been... Um, multiple commanders had had challenges with this person. It wasn't just me. I was the third commander that had had challenges. My predecessor had challenges. His, her predecessor had challenges. I just had the opportunity that we had to deal with it, and we had to address it. And so I put my plan together, did all the things you're supposed to do, worked with uh, civilian personnel, and uh, got to the point where it, we had enough um, enough opportunities for him to improve that it wasn't going to... Um, work out that way. So dreaded this conversation, anticipated the IG complaint, knew it was going to come, sat down with the gentleman, said, you know what, we're going to convert this position. Um, we're going to find another uh, place for you, but but here's here's why. And physically, looking at this individual, it looked like 25 pounds lifted off of his shoulders. He was a completely different person as I let him know that he was going to be doing something different. He didn't want the job. He, 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 wasn't, he knew he wasn't performing well. It was way too much pressure. As the chief said, it was in over his head. And I share that with you because sometimes we're, we're going through these motions and we're, we're thinking that this is only going to be hard on you know, the supervisor you know, sharing this information with the individual. When at the same time, the individual may not even realize it, that, that they want to be out of that situation too. And sure enough, we moved him to another opportunity. Um, he's thriving there. This organization is better than ever. Um, we have folks, the gentleman second from the left, um, Dan, he, he had already put his papers in to retire um, in part because of the situation. And now he's saying, man, I wish I could stay. And now I don't want to, I don't want to leave. This has been great. Um, but just another, an, another example, if we, if we needed any, um, that those leaders in those key organizations, if we don't handle them, we don't take care of, um, we don't love the organization enough, uh, they can do a lot more harm than good. So it's tough, but it's absolutely critical. And lastly, um, hopefully you can tell by the chief and I, uh, maybe not, but we like to have fun. And we like to uh, get out and, and encourage our folks. And it's not, just, it's not just the surface level, too. At the core, we spend way more time, as you do, too, at work than we do at home. Uh, we spend a little bit of time sleeping, a little snippet there talking to my husband when I get home. But the majority of my time is here. And so we need to have fun. We've got one life, and, and we, this is it. And as, as we get older, the years in front of us are a lot smaller than the years behind us. So we try to take advantage of every opportunity to have fun to lift people up, be positive, even when the times are tough. And we've had some tough times in this wing. Um, you've probably seen it in the news, going through that mold crisis this summer. That was extremely challenging. That was on par with my dad passing away, like how stressful that was and how that felt. I mean, it literally felt like someone was dying. But we had each other, and we had a great team, and the Chief's got a great story. So uh, I'm sure this is same on the Army side. Air Force side, we've got award programs, right? You want to recognize your top performers and those type of things. So we have kind of our Airman of the Quarter program in its various categories, and we recognize them quarterly. And then we have annual awards. So kind of the same thing. We've got uh, civilians in all the categories, enlisted in all the categories, officer in the categories, and we do our annual awards. Uh, for annual awards in general, uh, across the Air Force, we do kind of a big ceremony. A lot of times it's a, it's a formal event. Uh, sometimes it's a formal dinner, mess dress, the whole deal. Uh, we will put together a, 
a group, a, a group of pro Joes, and we'll say, okay, you know, you senior NCOs, you've got the annual awards ceremony this year. Uh, go forth, tell us what you want to do, and we'll give you the green light, and you can you can uh, execute. Uh, the the group this past year came to us, and they said, hey, you know that normally this formal thing that we do, we're really not feeling it. We'd like to do something a little bit different. We'd like to do kind of an informal sports theme. That go flies in the face of our culture. That is not something we do. Our annual awards are, like I said, very buttoned up, mess dress, formal dinner, the whole deal. Uh, so we kind of went, uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, and then we were like, you know what? What the hell? Go for it. Run with it. Uh, so this team went out, and, and so essentially they put together our annual award ceremony. We did it in the gym at Randolph at the fitness center. Uh, you can see this is just a smattering of the folks that are in there. Uh, we had kind of the blow-up uh, entrance runway. It was just like a sport. We, we announced all of our award nominees, and they came through, and it was the high-five thing, and everybody was going nuts. And you can see confetti on the floor there. Uh, we had the high school cheerleaders came out, and they were, like, on each other's shoulders, and they were doing the pom-pom. It was, it was ridiculous, but it was such a blast. Uh, we got Daryl Johnston, Moose Johnston from Dallas Cowboys, came down. He was our guest speaker for the thing. Uh, you can see in the background the scoreboard there, 502, 502, 2018, right? They spared no expense. The stage where we brought folks up to recognize them, somebody built a boxing ring. So, like, right there in the gym, it was just threw together a boxing ring. It, the, it was, it was uh, no holds barred, buffet-style kind of barbecue type thing, and it was a blast. And we did a, we did a tailgate party out in the parking lot prior to that. Serious. It was, and the only the only thing that that hurt it was it happened to be the one day in 2018 in San Antonio where it was cold. So it was like, yeah, the perfect timing. It was like 20 something degrees, and the wind was flying through there. So the tailgate party was like it was like Cleveland Browns tailgate party, right? It, you know, with the hand with the fire going, and the, but you know, people uh, still were out there and line dancing in the parking lot. It was just it was just ridiculous, but it was so much fun. And after the fact, everybody was like, this is the best awards ceremony we've ever had. It was, and, and people felt, uh, felt recognized and, and lifted up. It was, it was inspirational. So, so that's, that's the idea behind this. And it, it was outside the box. And it was our folks coming to us. So back to listen, right? We could have said, oh, hell no, that's not how you do things. You get, get your mess dress on. We'll see you at the dinner, right? Um, but uh, we, we took a chance, and, and it went off uh, like gangbusters. We're going to do it again this year. So they're actually putting it together right now. We've got some lines on some pretty stellar guest speakers. We'll see how it rolls out, fingers crossed. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so it was a blast. We had about 400 folks go to this one. We had plenty of room in the gym, so we're expecting probably closer to six or 700 for, for this year. So lift up. You, you never know what it's, what it's going to take and, and what's going to kind of get everybody excited. And sometimes it's risky, and we took a risk with this one, and it paid off gangbusters. So. Absolutely, and I think we have one more video. Yeah, so so from the kind of along the same lines as as lift up and and again back to uh, the the lollipop moments video that we showed uh, at one of our commanders calls uh, at a, one of our more recent commanders calls we did another video. Uh, it's uh, Dwayne Wade, and you'll see it here in a second. But uh, but it was kind of back to that connection piece and and having influence and inspiring people. Um, again, all tied back to the culture, but. Uh, very much a lift up moment, so that's why we kind of plugged it in here. But it also kind of takes us all the way back to that lollipop moment uh, video, and, and it'll help us kind of wrap this up. So, video. Who's coming? Like, literally, no idea. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Dwayne. Hello. Hello. How you doing, brother? Pretty good, and yourself? It's been about 12 years since I last seen you. I come from an area where not too many people make it. It was always my dream that I'd get the chance to go to college, but we just didn't have the money. You mean so much to us, and my brother Joaquin loved you from the beginning. 
He passed away in Parkland on February 14th. He was one of the 17 victims. 10 days before Christmas, our house burned down and we lost everything. It was one of the lowest points in my life. Hey, Dwight. How you doing, Mom? You were the joy of my life. But I was dropping the ball. That day that I just couldn't do it no more was the day that I was going to have to turn myself in. And I seen the tears just fall from your eyes. Your mama went down a road, Dwayne, that I didn't ever think I'd come back from. But on that road, I noticed you kept showing up. And you'll come and see about me. And Dwayne, because you believe in me, when I got out of prison, I was a different woman. We received a phone call. Would you mind if Dwayne Wade take you and the family <laughs> on a shopping spree? It just meant the world to me that you were there for us at this time. And Thank you. You became our hero. A lot of the words that you said hit a spark and kind of changed where I was going. Without you and your full tuition scholarship, none of this would have been possible. You're not way the basketball player, the legend. You're the human being that took the time and on his own wrote my brother's name on his shoe and you cared. When you bought your mama that church, you don't even understand the lives that you changed. So I don't have a jersey. But I brought you this. I don't have a jersey to trade with you, but I definitely have this. The blazer that I wore to my first job interview. My cap and gown from graduation. This is important because Joaquin wore this in his last championship. My family wanted you to have it. Please don't forget my brother, Joaquin. Having you as a role model has made all the difference. One of the special robes that you gave me purple symbolized royalty and you are royal in everybody's life that you've touched you completely changed the course of my life i know my brother is with you always it wouldn't been possible to be here if it wasn't you i am more proud of the man you have become than the basketball player you are bigger than basketball Gets you right in the feels, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to see if we get anybody to cry here. That was the whole, that was the whole intent behind that. So, uh, so what we did at our, our last commander's call, um, so within, within the wing structure of the Air Force, the next level down is group. So we've got, uh, we've got four groups, um, well, four groups in our wing staff agency, so five. Uh, we've got a senior enlisted leader on top of each of those organizations. Uh, Command Sergeant Major is, is the senior enlisted for our uh, force support group. Uh, but what we did is uh, we, we played the video and, and kind of, if, if anybody knows uh, kind of Dwayne Wade's history, he, he exchanges jerseys with, uh, with other players. And, and obviously, you can see he's got his, a foundation and does a lot of uh, philanthropic stuff uh, within the community. Um, but what we did is we ran that, and then uh, each of our uh, command senior enlisted uh, came up and pulled somebody out of the audience that, that has inspired them. Uh, and one of the conversations we were having was about, you know, we all kind of assume, we have this understanding that it's leaders' responsibility to inspire, but quite honestly, uh, we're inspired by the folks that work for us every day. And I, and I think everybody probably agrees with that. I mean, you don't, you don't, that's the reason you come to work, uh, is really because you're inspired by the folks that, that you're serving as the leader. Um, so uh, we did that, and, and each of our uh, senior enlisted leaders pulled somebody up out of the audience and, and kind of did a little thing on them and, and what has inspired them. And then we gave them a, a, some chevrons with uh, some notes written on the back from, from us to them. And it was, it was kind of a, it was a, it was a really cool thing. And, and it, uh, we got a lot of, we got a lot of uh, great kind of uh, feedback on it. Um, but it was just highlighting somebody, again, lifting them up, publicly lifting them up, talking about the things that they do uh, and telling them that they're important. And more importantly, telling them how they inspire us and not the other way around. You know, we're, we're just here to kind of knock down the hurdles for you. You're the inspirational ones. And that is the end of our formal presentation. Um, we, we are open for business, for questions, if we have time. You have about 10 minutes for questions.
promise we won't make anyone cry anymore. <laughs> sorry, we went long. Sorry. Any questions? Yes, sir. Hi, ma'am. Uh, Colonel Chip O'Neill. Oh, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, Colonel Chip O'Neill, thanks for being here. Question I have, um, with Joint Base San Antonio, including a pure Air Force base, two pure Air Force bases, and here you literally have every service represented, what kinds of compromises or things have you found yourself having to struggle with and trying to keep the scales balanced? So great, great question. Um, so the question was what, how do we balance all the different service uh, priorities, cultures, um, all those things? So we have, um, we have some, some formal things in place called governance and uh, all the boards that Carrie sits on and represents the team here at MedCom. Um, but we also have informal uh, where we actually uh, have office calls with folks and we try to understand what their priorities are. And, uh, you know, for instance, Army North, um, one of the previous commander's priorities was to get the new Braunfels gate open. That was a huge priority for that, that commander and they had tried multiple commanders to get the gate open. And it was for, for various reasons. It was for their mission needs, because they have, most people don't know, but right outside the fence line, they have their ops, they have an op center there. And they need, especially during hurricane season, they need to be going back and forth pretty quickly. Um, they also have a tr army tradition here. New Braunfels gate used to be open for the public. So there's a deep history of, of openness to that part of the community. And it was the right thing to do for um, for the reasons that that on the outside may not make any sense because you don't you're not privy to those conversations so not you in particular but other folks who are just now like why did they close the other gate that was the one we liked um, so how we try to do is we try to meet the commander's needs and balance risk and and see where we can where we can take some risk and at this that point in, in time it was important to me as the new commander to establish trust with that, that mission partner. And so that was a decision that, that I made based on the recommendation of that, or based on the ask of that commander, and then took the feedback. <laughs> so ultimately we do wanna open Wilson Gate back up to full hours. I mean, that's the goal, but we're not manned for that right now. So as we get healthier with our manning, um, just as everyone struggles with manning, we, we do too. And that workforce in particular is heavily civilian as well. So um, we're, we're getting after it. And we have a meeting with General Richardson actually tomorrow or later today, later today, <laughs> to talk about things like that around that topic. But I think the biggest thing, that's a long answer to, um, to a very good question, which is individual services have cultures, they have traditions, they have history, they have priorities, and we have to listen. And when we can't meet their needs right now, we try to explain it. And it doesn't always, you know, sit well because, you know, checks in the mail kind of thing. But we, we're truly trying to be as transparent as we can. And uh, we've made some progress this year with the joint base study so that um, Fort Sam Houston in particular, um, we're getting our one to end list of priority projects and getting that submitted as a, as a, a single list versus a combined list of all three or four installations. So that's a good thing. Um, multiple other initiatives, and Carrie and I can talk to you about that. We've lived it for the last year and a half. <laughs> Um, but there's there's uh, goodness in that study that I think will help. Any questions? Don't be bashful. Please, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say thank you for being here, number one. Number two, thank you. Um, the word that stuck out on your slide was followership. Follow, follow, followership, I think that followership, was it. Followership. Yes. Learn to be a good follower, so I appreciate that. And just a positive comment, the gates have been great always. And whether it's the Air Force, the Army, or the civilians, they do a great job. Thank so you. no questions, just some feedback for you. So you probably just solve problems all day long and hear negative. That's a positive I want. Thank you so much. Sure. I really appreciate that, and I'll share that with our team. Yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, I'll take you with a question. Probably is a tough question for uh, for you to deal with and it's the, the historical society and the relevance of the buildings on the installation and how you're trying to how you have to fight that battle with renovation and, and up updating new buildings and still fighting the the national historical society about every building here being historical because it's greater than 50 years old yeah how do you balance that or how do you tell them hey i only need one building that looks like this and they, let me tear everything else down and that could be your museum that's exactly that's exactly what we want to do that would be ideal 
Um, and there's a very strong historical society here in Texas, um, unlike any I've ever seen. I came from Scott Air Force Base, which is 100 years old, not nearly as old as here, as here but um, very a um, lot fewer historical buildings, but also the, the society isn't, isn't as um, vocal and they don't have as many guidelines and regulations. So that's something that we will we'll continue to bring up with our, our, our local leadership outside the fence line to help us with. Uh, we've got strong relationships outside the gate and we'll continue to beat that drum. But you're absolutely right. We can't afford to maintain all of these old buildings. Uh, it would be better to have one representative building that looks and we maintain it, and, and so it's historically accurate, uh, but then demolition dollars are also in high demand, and we have very few of those, but at least we could perhaps board up some of these in, in a way that isn't um, distasteful uh, to the eye, but then focus our dollars on, on, the, on the facilities that really do need the priorities. So I don't really have a way ahead besides exactly what you just described. And let's continue to advocate, and, if, and as your leadership is out in, in the community to um, continue to help us beat the drum of the need for historical preservation, but not at the expense of mission and limited dollars. In, in our earlier conversation, you used the word bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So another example of that bureaucracy, and I know our, our guys in our civil engineer group are trying to push through that too. The same argument that you just made, we don't necessarily need to maintain every building that's that age, as long as we have the the positive representation and we can kind of move on and, and maintain the facade for the rest of the buildings. Um, and now multiply that by three, because it's not just Fort Sam Houston. We've got the same buildings at Randolph and we've got the same buildings at Lackman. Our housing at Randolph is historical. Uh, and you've seen in the news with the privatized housing issues and one of the big lawsuits that's, that's kind of hitting the media right now is Hunt Housing from families right here at Randolph. And, you know, it, it's, you know, you, you kind of, to some extent, you know, Hunt's at fault or, or the privatized housing contractors are at fault, but to, to another extent, you know, the, the deck that they, were, that they were handed to play, you know, the hand they were given to play with, um, these houses were built in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, so so it's, it's difficult for them too. So, so yeah, that, that, that same argument. And it's the communication piece and kind of dovetails back with your question, sir. Um, trying to communicate with this large JBSA uh, organization, what those priorities are and where we can't meet those priorities. And, and when I walked in today and, and talked to Command Sergeant Major Gregg, the first thing he said to me was, finger in the chest, Corporal Johnson running track, right? And I owned it. I, 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 earned, I owed him an answer to that because we had a conversation about it not too long ago and I dropped the ball and I didn't get back to him on it. Uh, it's on our prioritization list and we're trying to get after it. But again, it's, you know, budgets are tight. And when everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So, so that's what we struggle with. And, and just uh, to throw some numbers out there, and, and anytime I get a chance to say this publicly, I, I like to, but um, our 2000, uh, 2019 fiscal program, when it comes to facility sustainment restoration dollars, uh, we put in a program of $76 million. That's what we needed, $76 million for 2019. And that's one small pot of money. That's not counting Milcon and a, and a bunch of other things, 600 plus million worth in Milcon that we need. 76 million was the program we put in with budget cuts and money being pulled off for uh, weapon systems and different things like that. Uh, we got 9 million. So you ask for 76 and you get nine. And just like we were talking about earlier, we've got a shelf load of pro projects that need to get done and they're all sitting right here. And, and oh, by the way, some of those projects were the same things that we just dealt with, with our defect that, that had mold in it and, and issues with our dorms. How do you get after it when 80 something percent of your program gets cut on day one? But I have good news. There is. So, <laughs> your building is going to get the refurbishment on the outside that, we, that we've that we been promising you forever and ever and ever, <laughs> this building. And also we have $250,000 set aside for the track. We know it's going to take about a million, so that's going to take a chunk away, but we're going to keep after it because um, I'm with you, that, that track needs help. And all of our roads, there's lots of road projects this year. And just to clarify the Chief's comments, um, so the, the 76 down to 9 was mainly due to Tyndall. Uh, Tyndall Air Force Base was hit by that hurricane in September of 2018, uh, wiped out the entire base, and um, the Air Force had to, had to rebuild it. So they took money from, you know, all of us, and we happened to be, you know, one of the f people they took it from, and that, that makes sense. You know, they got to take care of that base, but, but as a result, we're a year behind in where we wanted to be today. And in a base like this, when it's old, you take a year off, it, it hurts. <laughs> 
please, please join me giving them a round of applause. <laughs> so again, I, I hope that, that you, you gleaned something from this. Um, you know, we have two of our, our very own tremendous leaders that are leading our joint base community. You know, again, the largest joint base. And, you know, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to just come share what I thought was some phenomenal nuggets of wisdom as it deals to leadership, as well as giving insight to what you all deal with on a daily basis as far as the management of facilities. So on behalf of, you know, the, the OTSG MedCom staff, uh, we just like to give you a small token of appreciation from Command Sergeant Major and I. So, Chief, Laura, and thank you. Thank you so much. Give them one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Sergeant Major, anything? Uh, I think I turned the mic off, so I'll just speak loud. Is there, are we streaming it to somebody? No. So, it's always a, a pleasure and, and a learning experience to learn from everybody. And one of the things that we, we have not always embraced um, is learning from our sister services because we, we look at them and because we all have our separate missions, we don't always say that we are on the same mission, but ultimately we all have the same mission and we are sworn to defend the constitution against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. And, and that said, thank you for your commitment to do that for us and to fight the fights for us that we don't necessarily realize that are being fought for us. Because from an army perspective, it's easy for us to say, the Air Force is, 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 is jobbing us. They're giving us a job. And if you go to Randolph, look, the grass is cut different. But the, ra the grass was always cut different. You know? So you're maintaining the standard that Randolph had, and, and you're trying to bring up what we didn't do for Fort Sam Houston for a long time before the Air Force took over Fort Sam Houston. Because up until 2010, we ran it into the ground ourselves and didn't do a whole lot. So to the both of you, I know you're getting some gray hairs from us by pushing it and, and priding on you, but I want you to know that we do appreciate the fights and, and those that are senior know and are, are trying to dispel the rumors that it's unequal treatment. We're trying to make sure that uh, you understand that we do un know that you're in that fight for us. So thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. So and, and finally in closing, um, what's going to happen? Um, what what Commander Sergeant Major and I are going to do on a monthly basis, uh, as well as General Bagby, is we're investing in the North and the South as far as leadership. And so we'll be doing this on a monthly basis. And so for those of you all who are still avid leaders willing to learn and open to leadership lessons, we'll be doing this right here um, on a recurring basis. Um, and again, it, it is not mandatory, but this is just for those who are interested in leadership. And so um, you'll see us down here, on, right here, talking leadership, and we're going to have different leaders coming in. As we do it, what's going to happen, I explained to this earlier, um, two things. One, they're going to be posterized. And so we have a picture that we're going to put on a poster um, that's going to have the leadership nuggets of wisdom that they shared with us today. And then as we do our leadership lecture series, each time we'll add the predecessor up there, and then we'll give you a small mini poster for you and Chief to have in your office. So um, once again, thank you all. Um, and, you know, Air Force lucked up and beat Army for the first time here in a couple of years. So it was, home, it was home field advantage. It was home field advantage. Well, yeah. Bring yeah. It up. You couldn't read it. Yeah. But since you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would like to do in closing is I want to, I want to give you all a pic, another picture, too, with all of us around you. Because, again, as Sergeant Major mentioned, it's not often that we do the joint thing together. And leadership is, 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 is one color regardless of what uniform that you wear. And so, and that's the color of excellence. So with that, if I can get everybody to come up here, let's do a, a quick group picture before you, you head back to work. And thank you all for coming out. Are y'all lost the Navy? We lost the Navy. So if we beat we Navy. Lost the Navy. Yeah. It's up in the oh, air, yeah. right? Yeah. It's up in the yeah. air. Come on. Yep. Don't be bashful. Come on. Ready? All right, sting it. What are we singing? You got it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Are oh, you need to go back up a little more? All right, thank you all. Again, if you get a chance, please congratulate our guests and thank you then for coming out.